So, as many of you know, the promotional literature for uh, this year's uh, institute uh, includes, talks about the theme, uh, which says building interfaith dialogue and collaboration through theology and disability. I think this is a very potent, this is potentially a very fruitful uh, topic, and I'm very excited about the conversations that we'll have in this next week. As my training is in biblical studies, and I work in a large secular university, I'm especially excited about studying sacred texts in this context. Of course, as we all know, sacred texts from, very, from various religious traditions contain material about disability that presents challenges for disability advocates. At the same time, these texts and traditions provide rich resources to think through matters of disability and theology together. However, we have to be aware of how we are using the resources of our various traditions when engaging in interfaith dialogue. Rather than building dialogue, it is easy to use the texts and resources from one's own tradition over against those texts that one might share with another tradition. For example, in the Christian tradition in which I was raised, uh, there was sometimes a tendency to use a passage from the New Testament to correct or replace a theological idea from the Hebrew Bible. Init intentionally or not, this can result in misrepresenting certain theological ideas from the Hebrew Bible. This situation is not uncommon in Christian theological work on disability. In a way, uh, we've, uh, we've, we've, we've been guilty to a certain extent, I should say, of uh, what Hans referred to as the don'ts uh, in the way we've used uh, some of our work on disability in interfaith dialogue. I don't have time today to go through all of the examples, so I'll choose a few from the work of Nancy Eastland uh, because her work is well known and it can, turn, it can serve as a representative, a representative example of uh, what I mean. In a 2002 article, she summarized many of the themes of her seminal work and one of my favorite books, uh, The Disabled God. In this article titled, Encountering the Disabled God, she wrote, quote, the holiness code of Leviticus 17 through 26 communicates a strong message that physical disability is a distortion of the divine image and an inherent desecration of all things holy. Bodily unholiness, unholiness is unclean and needs to be kept at the periphery of the community. Leviticus 21, 18 through 20 prohibits anyone, and here she's quoting from Leviticus 18 uh, through 20, um, blind or lame, one who has a mutilated face or a limb too long, or who has a broken foot or a broken hand or a hunchback or a dwarf or a man with a blemish in his eyes from priestly activities or entering the most holy place in the temple, end quote. So, according to Eastland, Leviticus communicates the idea that one, physical disability is a distortion of the divine image, and two, it is unclean. Actually, uh, sometimes that word unclean is translated better as a impure uh, because the Hebrew word doesn't have a hygienic connotation. Regarding the divine image, Islam finds a more liberating theology than she thinks that Leviticus offers in the image of the resurrected Jesus. In the same article, she reminds us that, quote, the foundation of Christian theology is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Yet seldom is the resurrected Christ recognized as a deity whose hands, feet, and side bear the, bear the marks of profound physical impairment, end quote. She continues, quote, Jesus Christ, the disabled God, repudiates the conception of disability as a consequence of sin. Our bodies participate in the image of God, not in spite of our impairments and contingencies, but through them, end quote. Here, Eason uses the idea of the disabled God 
to repudiate the connection between sin and disability in verses from the Gospels, such as John 5.14, which contains Jesus' warning to a person who had a disability to, quote, not sin anymore so that nothing worse happens to you, end quote. However, we should also notice that for Eastland, Jesus' resurrected body allows us, allows for our physical disabilities to participate in the divine image rather than distort the divine image, as she claims Leviticus does. Essentially, a theology of the resurrection is used to replace theological ideas that she finds in Leviticus. To be clear, I think Eastland offers an amazingly insightful interpretation of Jesus' resurrected body. Her work represents a very constructive uh, contribution to, th to Christian theology, and the influences of her work in Christian disability theology cannot be overestimated. Nevertheless, there is a deep problem for interfaith dialogue if we use Leviticus as a negative foil when constructing a theology of disability. You know, if the assumption is sort of that, uh, you know, if uh, the Hebrew Bible offers a bad theology of the divine image, then the New Testament offers a good theology of the uh, divine image. Uh, you know, that's, uh, that could be problematic for interfaith uh, dialogue. Um, it diminishes Eastland's otherwise profound and important analysis of Jesus' resurrection if we use her idea to supersede certain theological ideas in the Hebrew Bible. Regarding your point about uh, uh, uncleanness uh, and its connection to sin, it's important that we examine actually how Leviticus discusses uncleanness, or again, better, impurity uh, and disability in relation to sin. And just as a warning, uh, I'm about to get into some technicalities about biblical law, so I hope you're awake or at least uh, well caffeinated. <laughs> In the disabled God, Eastland quotes Leviticus 20, uh, 18 through 20, uh, 21, 18 through 20 again, and uh, she supports the claim, uh, she, she used that text, I should say, to support the claim that, quote, in the Hebrew scriptures in particular, the conflation of moral impurity and physical disability is a common theme, end quote. Yet Leviticus, which contains the most detailed discussion of impurity in the Hebrew Bible, discusses more than one source of impurity, and most of these sources are never connected to morality. Biblical scholars distinguish moral impurity, sometimes called forbidden impurity, from ritual impurity, sometimes called tolerated impurity. So moral impurities, for instance, include uh, several of the prohibited sexual activities. There's a big, huge list of them in Leviticus 18, if you want to read them. Uh, they, uh, moral impurities also include uh, consultations with uh, wizards or mediums, in Leviticus 19.31, um, and also bloodshed in uh, Numbers 35 as well. With few exceptions, all these moral impurities result from avoidable actions or pollutions of certain sacred spaces. But Leviticus also recognizes that some sources of impurity are unavoidable. For example, a person can also become impure uh, if uh, intentionally or not they eat something impure, they touch something impure, for instance, a, a dead body or a corpse, uh, they develop a skin disease. Skin disease is often mistranslated as leprosy. Leprosy is a horrible translation uh, for that word. Um, they enter a quarantined house, they have a genital discharge, including menstruation, or they give birth. Uh, all these things are considered ritual impurities. In these cases, the way one becomes pure again is through some combination of uh, washing their body, washing their clothes, or simply sometimes through the passage of time. So after enough time elapses, you're just pure again. Or in a few cases, also uh, include uh, offering, uh, making an offering. It's important to understand 
that Leviticus does not consider these sources of ritual impurity as sinful. So again, things like skin diseases, for instance, are not considered sinful. In fact, people are explicitly commanded to perform several actions that will make them inevitably impure. For example, in the book of Genesis, the very first commandment that God ever gives to a human is to be fruitful and multiply. That's a Genesis 1.28, also Genesis 9, 9 uh, verse 1. Um, now, being fruitful and multiply uh, involves intercourse and childbirth. Uh, both of those actions will make you impure. Uh, or if you're a priest, for instance, uh, some of the sacrifices that you are required to make as a priest involve touching dead uh, corpses, animals, and also burial practices. Um, those, again, will make you impure. Um, so, for example, uh, after a priest makes a certain sacrifice, Numbers uh, chapter 19, verse 7 says, quote, The priest shall wash his clothes and bathe his, bathe his body in water, and afterwards he may come into the camp, but the priest shall remain impure until evening. So again, my point is that ritual impurity for even priests is not a moral issue. And sometimes, in fact, sometimes it's a byproduct of their job requirements. Uh, whether you're a priest or not, one inevitably becomes impure if one follows the biblical commandments. Ritual impurity only becomes sinful when one ignores the instructions to purify oneself. Numbers 19, verse 20, for example, is uh, very explicit on this point. Quote, Any who are impure but do not purify themselves, these persons shall be cut off from the assembly, for they have defiled the sanctuary of the Lord. End quote. So again, notice, it's not the ritual impurity itself that carries the moral stigma. Instead, it's the failure to follow the purification instructions after you inevitably become impure, that becomes a moral issue. So physical conditions like skin diseases, for instance, or bodily discharges, or childbirth, may be sources of impurity, but they're not sources of moral impurity. Not only are these physical conditions unrelated to sin, they're also unrelated to disabilities. Although Eastland claims that the Hebrew Bible often conflates physical disability and moral impurity, the blemishes listed in Leviticus 21 and 22, uh, which I'll talk about more in more detail tomorrow, uh, are never described as either ritually or morally impure. The Hebrew word uh, often translated as impurity uh, or unclean never appears during these discussions of priests or animals uh, with uh, blemishes. Also, these passages do not require folks with disabilities to uh, purify themselves if, for instance, you know, or the, the altar, for instance, does not need to be purified, I should say, if a priest with a blemish performs a sacrifice on it or an animal with a blemish is sacrificed on it. Uh, you know, if that happens, there is no instruction to purify the altar as you would have to do if the altar were to become um, pure. And uh, Leviticus 21, verse 22, also uh, describes that, you know, it, it says that a priest with a disability uh, can eat a certain food that you're not allowed to eat if you're impure. So the fact that the priest can still eat this food suggests that he is not considered impure. Okay. So I'll talk a little bit more about the priests with blemishes uh, or disabilities tomorrow, but for now I just want to point out that Leviticus treats impurities, disabilities, and sin as three different issues. It does not conflate these issues, nor does it connect disability or ritual impurity, uh, such as skin diseases, to sin. Thus, it is unnecessary to turn to Jesus' resurrected body to repudiate a connection between disability and sin in Leviticus because Leviticus never makes that connection in the first place. 
in using texts from Leviticus as negative foils for constructing the theology of the disabled God, one may be misrepresenting the, theolo the theological ideas in sacred texts that one might share with other religious traditions. Let me wrap things up by saying I am actually very uh, greatly indebted to Nancy Eastland. Uh, like many of us, I was first exposed to the study of disability and religion uh, through her work, and I have no desire to take anything away from her amazing legacy. Nonetheless, I want to stress that if we are serious about interfaith dialogue and collaboration, we will have to take seriously the challenges it will present to the ways that we use sacred texts to construct theologies of disability. Thank you. <laughs>